Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. This episode of the Cross Border Interviews was recorded live at the SUMA Conference in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in April. Our show is dedicated to sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada, and our goal is to learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Today's guest is Warman Councillor Marshall Seed. Um, Where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Councillor Seed? Uh, a lot of it for me came from uh, growing up in the Scouts uh, movement. Uh, Beavers, Cubs, Scouts, uh, dedication to the community, volunteerism. I uh, was recognized uh, as, a, as a youth um, by the Governor General for Outstanding Citizenship and achieved a Chief Scout Award, and it just really was an implemented on me that uh, don't stand around and wait for it, get up and do something about it. So you, you didn't stand around and wait for something, you got involved municipally. Yeah. Uh, what, for, what was it about municipal politics that was the f draw for you? Nothing. Um, the, uh, the Honesty, I love it in a politics. Yeah, the, the ultimate goal for me was that uh, um, I had seen in our community um, a big uptake in crimes of opportunity. And it was simple things like people leaving their vehicles unlocked, garage doors open, and then complaining that the police weren't doing anything about it. And that really, really frustrated me. Um, so I actually implemented uh, at a town hall meeting the desire, challenged our mayor at the time, uh, Cheryl Spence, who was an amazing lady. Um, what were they going to do about, you know, crime and had they looked at supporting any kind of neighborhood watch program? And she said, why don't you do it? No, I did, and as I was walking out of the back of the building, another resident that uh, I didn't know, who's now one of my closest friends, stood up and said, let's do this together. And I was like, okay, so we started a neighborhood watch program, didn't know anything about it, and uh, ended up uh, having a couple of serious incidents that uh, involved the neighborhood watch with people threatening us directly, or, and when we approached the, uh, the staff like sergeant... threatening you or threatening the organization? Uh, individuals, yeah, um, as we were out patrolling and such, and, and uh, so as we went to... At, at that time, the staff sergeant with the RCMP, um, he basically told us we were doing too much and we asked him how we could be more effective and he told us that we could patrol a baseball game or something. And uh, I said to him, you're gonna be held accountable for what you say. And he says, well, if you're on council, I will, but until then it doesn't matter. And I ran for council immediately. And when I was on council, uh, he resigned. Wow. Which is awesome. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. yeah. But I want to start with this. Municipal politics is the frontline politics of all governments. You are the Absolutely. ones that are in your community. You're not in Regina. You're not in Ottawa. Absolutely. How do you balance yourself with the needs of your community? Because I'm assuming there's days that you just want to be just good old. Sorry, yep. I was going to yep. call you Councillor C. No, that's like Marshall. Fine. Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the days you just want to be Marshall and there's days that you have to be Councillor C. But as a Councillor, you are always Councillor C when you go out. 100%. So how do you do that? How do you balance that in your town of Warman? So for me, it's not about uh, which hat am I putting on today. Um, I'm a community advocate. I've always been the person that says don't complain get up and do something about it okay um, I campaigned on actions not words I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to show you what I'm going to do um, so for balancing it is you take a an oath as a city councillor to say that you're going to do what's in the people's best interest you're going to be open you're going to be honest you're going to be transparent I don't have the mental capacity to know how to do anything any other way so for me it's just go out and, and you know I have residents stop me at I've got three sons uh, 18 uh, 11 and 9 they're all involved in sports, they're all involved in community activities, and I'm just as likely to get stopped at a baseball game or a hockey game and somebody's going to complain about a street light out or speeding in their area or another concern of theirs. And uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you've taken the oath to, to hear that, and uh, if you're not going to do it, then get off council. Okay. You get again more to unpack here. Yeah. You are about actions, not words. 100%. That's great. Yeah. Not trying to throw you under the bus no, here, but good. I'm going to play a little devil's advocate yes. with you. Do you engage with your residents when the issues come up uh, what, at council? Because you're there to represent them, but you're saying, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do long, drawn-out words and tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do it. Right. How do you balance engagement with the desire to show the people of Warman what you're going to do? It's a good question. There's been a lot of times where um, I've decided... 
prior to communicating with residents that the answer to the question is A. Yeah. And then after engaging people and listening to what they have to say, I've went, you know what, maybe I'm not right. Um, I, I, the vast majority of people feel B, then that's how I'm going to vote. Um, unless it's something that is a fundamental principle of my own belief system that I say I cannot support that because it's not who I am and not who my family is, um, I will absolutely listen to the majority of people. That's democracy at its finest. And, and I think that often politicians... Do you uh, consider yourself a politician? No, I'm an elected councillor and I never want to be a politician. That's the, that's the, and I, people so what say the, that. What, what does a politician mean to you then? You know, yesterday we were in a session that absolutely shook me, um, that they showed that 66% of people surveyed across Canada believes that uh, elected officials are lying to them. And I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, and it I'm surprised me. it's that low. Right, absolutely, right? <laughs> and it, it, that bothers me because at the end of the day, I'm not going to tell you always what you want to hear, but I am going to tell you the truth. Does that um, get you in trouble a lot? More often than not. And yeah. you're okay with that? sleep very well every night a clean conscious no worries about i you know you don't have to worry about running into me in two or three years and me telling you a different version of the story and, and that's that's my own um that's one of my principal values is to is to be you know be honest be upfront it again it doesn't mean you have to like it but i'd rather you be upfront and honest with me and then we can move ahead to try to find something that's going to work for everyone um, so going back to your community, yep. how do you use that sort of guiding principle when it comes to major decisions? Because y you have to sort of go in with an understanding that you're not going to vote a certain way until all the information is presented to you. Mm -hmm. But you also have to realize that there's always unconscious biases that mm -hmm. you're going to sway one way or the other. So even though you are a man of war action, do you self-reflect when you're at that council table and say, okay, one plus one equals two, no matter how you put it. Mm -hmm. But this issue here, where I thought it's one plus one, is actually two times two, mm -hmm. and it's completely com not what I was thinking it was going to be. Yeah, math is hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, No, it, it's a, it's, it, uh, you know, have I made mistakes in the two years I've been on council? 100%. Um, but it's only a mistake if you do it twice, right? Besides that, it's a learning opportunity. Um, I've certainly had, um, I guess, polarizing decisions that I've went, I don't even know why we're discussing this. This is the way that I believe. And then we get into uh, a setting where people are presenting their points of view and points of view that I've never experienced, I've never lived, I've never grown up in. And you go, you know what, they, they got a point there. Um, and, and then you really have to weigh out of what you think is the greatest for the majority of the residents. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And I don't care whether it's something as simple as a, you know, a discretionary use for a daycare or whether it's a new building going up. You know, you have to look at what is the greater good. And, and I think that as an elected official, you have to be selfless in the fact that it may be something that I personally want, but if it's not going to benefit our community in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, let's not waste anybody's time. I want to talk about apathy for a second. Yep. Apathy is a big concern to me. Right. It is one thing that I think a lot more Canadians are not voting in our elections and are not engaged in our elections. Absolutely. Turnout is going down. Absolutely. Municipally is probably one of the worst. It is. Yep. Do you see that in Mormon? And do you, how do you battle against the apathy in your community with engagement? You know, um, I, I think that one of, the, uh, one of the biggest surprises for me is that in our uh, election cycle, um, we unfortunately had a massive blizzard the day of our election, and uh, some communities around us um, elected to defer the election because of that. We went forward with it. Uh, our population at the time was about 12,000, um, maybe 12,500, and I believe that we had less than 700 people show up to vote. So we're talking about 5% of the population. Now, whereas a lot of people look at that as that, that could be a massive problem, um, I actually look at it and think um, that shows that our community is doing a lot of things right because people don't care. And what that what I mean by that is they're happy and they're comfortable. Okay, devil's advocate, do yep. they not care or do they not care about politics? There's no presiding issues that they feel strongly uh, enough about that they need to get out and change. So you think up. apathy is linked to issues? Uh, it can be, not entirely. I certainly think that there's a younger demographic of, of individuals um, that really just don't have a clue. Uh, and whether that's because 
uh, we have the attitude of it doesn't matter who you vote for, a crook is a crook, or um, it's not going to change anything anyways. And those are the people that, uh, I mean, while they're entitled to their opinion, they couldn't be more wrong. Um, if you see something that you think is wrong, you need to stand up. You need to do something about it. And if that means that you become an elected official because nobody else is willing to take that stand, then that's the consequences you'll suffer. Looking back on your two years, yeah. you are halfway through your first term. What have you learned that you're hoping to sort of carry over and do better in your second half of your term? One of the things that I've learned, and it's something that is remarkable, and, and I say it with the utmost respect to everybody that has been on Warman, uh, either as a city or a town before me, is progressive thinking that they do uh, really is second to none. Um, often decisions that we're making around the council table are not going to be affecting our community in the next two to five years. They're affecting our community in the next 10, 15, and 20 years. And that forward thinking is something that has brought Warman um, to be the fastest growing community in Saskatchewan uh, and at one point in Canada. Um, for anybody to sit on council that wasn't there previously and say that they had a part of that is delusional. Um, so I'm hoping that in five years and ten years down the road, um, the metrics that our population will see is a result of decisions that myself and my peers made at this time. Um, so to answer your question, uh, I, I really think that what I would like to, I think what I have improved on or, or strive to improve on is even more community engagement and being a little more willing to listen to people that don't have the same point of view as me. Um, it, it's tough and it's you gotta you gotta check your ego and that's a hard thing to do for most people because we have our opinions. So on the flip side of that, yeah. what advice would you give first term councillors right now who are Ontario, Manitoba, uh, uh, New Brunswick, BC, all just went through municipal elections last yeah. year. They're all in their first 100, 200 days in office. What yeah. advice would you give them as a relatively new councillor yeah. to them to say, this is how you, not how you should do it, but this is how you can do it to make it easier for yourself. <laughs> Two things. And, and you know, it's not going to make it easier, but it's going to make your life better. Question everything and don't accept because that's the way we've always done it. Worst and thing you could say in municipal government. That's the way we've always done it. I, it drives me absolutely nuts. Yeah. And when people say that to me, I ask them how the carburetor in their vehicle is. Well, we haven't had that technology in 20 years. Why? Because we found a better way. Oh. So I'm going to end on this question here. Uh, actually, I'm going to end on two questions. This is the first one. What does good governance mean to you? Good governance is something that is a basic fundamental of our democracy and uh, yet is one of the hardest things to do is good governance, governance is openness, honesty even when it hurts you, and transparency. And it's very, very hard to achieve all three of those because people become polarized by small issues and won't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Do you think you've accomplished those three? Every day is a new day. Um, I, I don't think that there's any one issue that any resident would say, you know, Marshall is absolutely the best at it. There's no question about that. And I, and I mean, I, I would like to be that way, but I can say that with a high degree of confidence that anybody that has ever reached out to me knows that I've done everything I can to get them their resolution. Will you listen to all sides? 100%. Because when you're on council, you know that there's probably a liberal or NDP or green or conservative people's yep. party, whatever. But at the end of the day, you're the city of warming council. You're not politically striped. You're the city of warming council. Yep. Will you listen to someone who might have a complete opposite opinion than you and still give them respect? You have to give respect. Um, respect is not something, though, that is given right off the bat. Respect yeah. is earned, yeah. and that goes both ways. I have to earn their respect by listening to them. Um, somebody with different points of view, absolutely. Um, there's certain fundamentals that, based on, on political alliances, um, that are difficult for me to understand. Um, but certainly, I mean, you have to be at least willing to listen to them, but I'm also the first one uh, to tell them if I think they're full of crap, they're full of crap. And if they can show me why I'm wrong, I'm 100% willing to learn from that. So you're able to adapt. You have to, right? I'd, I'd like to introduce you to a few politicians that I've met in my time <laughs> who are not willing to adapt. Um, so my last question, and this is the, the million dollar ending question, sure. and it's about the city of Warman. Yes. In your opinion, what makes the city of Warman such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? 
I'll start off with the reason that I came to Warman, and that was approximately 11 years ago. Um, my wife, uh, we were living in Saskatoon in the North End, and she decided that uh, she wanted to go look in Warman because one of her good friends lived there, and I told her we are absolutely not moving to Warman. I'm not interested in it. So later that day, we went to Warman to go look at houses, and uh, we ended up finding a house that day, bought it, and moved in 15 days later. Um, what I've learned, uh, the reason for going there originally was that it's a, it's a beautiful community. Uh, it has a lot of parks and recreational amenities and it's a, it's a bedroom community. Um, now, uh, what keeps me there is that the city is built for our kids. Um, all you need to do is go out on any given day and see literally hundreds of kids on bikes, on scooters, on foot doing whatever going to our parks using our paths using our recreational sports and culture uh, areas our skate park our hockey rinks um, everything we do in our community is for our kids and uh, I, I don't believe that there's another I guess say it come on <laughs> well I, I don't know if there's another town or city that has quite the same dedication as Warman does to our kids and uh it's something that, it's a kind of community and the best way I could describe it is that if my kids are supposed to be home at 8 o'clock and they're not home at 9 o'clock, I'm not that worried. If they're not home by 9.30, maybe we start calling another neighbor to see if they've seen them. And I don't know if there's many communities in Saskatchewan. Is it like the, like the 8.30, that. like you know where your kids are because all the bikes are in the front of the person? We still do that. <laughs> they leave them in the front yard so that you can tell where they are. And you're not worried about the bikes getting stolen. Right? Wow. And the kids look out for each other. And it really, Warman still has that attitude of it takes a village. And we've got all of the amenities of a large city that's within 15 minutes drive, which is quicker than you can drive across the city. Yet we still have the relative comfort of a small town. And it's big enough that you don't know everybody, but it's small enough that you can find out who they are. Thank you so much to our guests for joining us for this episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share their stories with you. If you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high quality content. Every little bit helps. We appreciate your support as well. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes. And if you can, please don't forget to subscribe to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more behind-the-scenes content, show updates, and so much more. And finally, as much as we all love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life, in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Cross Border Interviews. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.